Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the March 25th Lunch and Lead session. My name is Nancy Dressel. I'm the president-elect of the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin, and I'm honored to be filling in for our president, Donna Heitmanik, uh, who is enjoying a well-deserved vacation at the moment. Donna was hoping to pop in and listen today um, as she's in between scuba diving adventures, um, but she was so excited about having Dawn with us that even Donna's hoping to pop in. Um, please check your microphone and see that it's muted. Um, as I continue this brief introduction, please introduce yourself in the chat and you will notice that there is a very generous link from our presenter today um, with additional information. And then I also added the link to the Wisconsin Read site. We will be monitoring the chat. Uh, so we'll try and uh, address any questions that you have that you put in there. Uh, this Lunch and Lead series is designed to connect you with literacy leaders and to support your continuous learning about the implementation of evidence-based literacy practices, systems, and structures. And today we are honored to have Dawn Brookhart with us. She's the Associate Director of the AIM Institute for Learning and Research. She has worked in public education for over 20 years, serving in various administrative roles, including the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Technology in the Danville Area School District, where she created a national model for a school district with the science of reading that turned a district into a top performing school district in her state. She also founded the Danville Area Reading and Dyslexia Academy, which was the first of its kind of public schools in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Today, Dawn is gonna be speaking with us about the positive impact of disruptive leadership and literacy advancing equity for all learners by breaking the cycle of mediocrity. I'm so excited to learn with all of you and with Dawn today. Thank you, Dawn, for joining us. We're so excited to have you with us. Well, good afternoon. Um, just wanted to take a moment to thank Donna Hepmanick and Nancy Dressel and the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin for the opportunity to spend some time with each of you this afternoon to discuss the positive impact of disruptive literacy, uh, leadership and literacy. When I think of leaders who are true disruptors, I think of Donna Hipmanic, because she's a role model for all of us. Through her selfless and tireless efforts, she has advanced the science of reading movement for thousands of educators and has disrupted the traditional educational cycle of just teaching to the middle. In addition, I'm also very fortunate to work for an organization that represents positive disruption in the way we educate our students and train our teachers. AIM Institute for Learning and Research was founded by two passionate moms, Pat Roberts and Nancy Blair, who refused to accept the status quo approached, used in schools, and reimagined and reinvented a school system and a research institute that translates the research into evidence-based practice. I also wanna thank each of you for giving up your most precious commodity, your time, to grow yourself and those around you for the betterment of all students. Since this is just a shortened session this afternoon, I hope to bring some valuable points that can help you self-reflect and begin to think about how you can reimagine equity in education through advancing the science of reading and changing the systematized teach to the middle philosophy. We won't have time to discuss all of these critical components for creating and sustaining an equitable culture of literacy that embraces evidence-based practice for all learners, but I hope to highlight a few points. And that first point being, be that positive disruptor, be the agent for change in your building in your district, and you'll do that through shared learning and leadership and also a systems-based approach through a healthy accountability system. I just want to spend a few minutes to talk about myself in the sense of what really inspires me. My professional life has really been inspired by the children I have taught and served as well as my own children. The children can continue to inspire me to not only want to be better, but to be fearless in leading the change process. I chose this picture because as a family, it really represents a major milestone. 
My oldest daughter struggled with reading, but I wasn't aware of her struggles with reading until the bottom fell out for her in fourth grade. And let me tell you, it was a wake up call for me as a leader and an educator. And it was actually my second wake up call in education. At that time, the system was failing her and I was charged with leading that system as the director of curriculum, instruction and technology. Even though I started to change the system a few years prior by moving the district away from balanced literacy and toward a structured literacy program after discovering the science of reading, thanks to another amazing mom who opened my eyes to how reading really should be taught. For my oldest daughter, the change did not happen quickly enough. And that's why it was my second wake up call. The change that was impacting grades in pre-kindergarten through second grade by training all teachers using the Orton-Gilling CAM approach had not become the norm for our intermediate school, which was my daughter's school at the time. On the other hand, you see my youngest daughter in this picture. She received a high quality course structured literacy curriculum taught by well -trained te a well-trained teacher who used the Orton-Gillingham approach. Today, She's a voracious reader and writer, and I attribute her success to the really wonderful, talented teachers and a strong structured literacy curriculum. However, when you look at this picture and see my oldest daughter, she wasn't that lucky. She's what we call in the dyslexic world, a compensator. She had fooled her teachers and me, her parent, for years by memorizing words. But memorization no longer worked for her as the content became increasingly difficult. We thought she was an advanced reader in first grade, but she became a casualty of balanced literacy. Fast forward, nine years later, here we are, a lot of work and support from a remarkable group of teachers. And now at Georgia Tech, she's the perfect example of a neurodiverse learner. Georgia Tech embraces this type of learner. My daughter found her place to grow and learn, but unfortunately, most of our pre-K through 12 public education systems aren't set up to embrace diversity and the needs of diverse learners. Education is really supposed to be a place to learn for all students, and our job as leaders is to create an equitable learning environment for students, regardless of label. And that's one of the biggest challenges because the traditional education system as we know it isn't set up for that. The traditional system is set up to teach to the middle and the only way students typically receive differentiation is if they are given a label through identification. If you could kindly please type into the chat the level of reading proficiency for your students in, at the fourth grade level either in your school or district. And as you think about that, I'd ask you to think about how many could be called compensators? How many at this point in fourth grade are fooling you thinking that they can read proficiently? I'm seeing some of those percentages come in. Thank you for your honesty in sharing that. So how do your proficiency levels of your students at fourth grade stack up? against the national statistics? Well, according to the nation's report card from the National Center for Education Statistics in the US, 65% of our fourth grade students are not reading at grade level. This has been unchanged in the last 25 years. I wanna emphasize this point because what we are doing isn't working. And isn't the definition of insanity the idea that we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I just also want to point out that approximately 80% of those are from low socioeconomic backgrounds. The greatest inequity stems for our ability to recognize that the majority, majority of these lowest performing students come from those low socioeconomic backgrounds. 
I'll also share with you that the research also shows 70% of below average readers in first grade remain below average readers in eighth grade. And children with reading difficulties in third grade are likely to struggle throughout their entire educational careers. I'd like you each to think about that and think about the models you have in place that help be more proactive in reaching these struggling readers early on in their educational careers. I'll also add that struggling readers statistics show us are four times more likely than their peers to drop out of school. With black and Hispanic children who are not reading proficiently in third grade, twice as likely as their white peers to drop out before high school graduation. So as I mentioned before, what systems do you have in place for screening in kindergarten? Or are you waiting to identify the struggling readers even in first grade, second grade, third grade, or like my daughter in fourth grade, and the bottom totally falls out for them? What we don't realize is because of the way the systems are set up, we're giving the nod to mediocrity because we're not challenging our own beliefs or checking our own knowledge. I believe mediocrity is the disease of public education because it's a system that's really designed to teach to the middle. In any system, there exists a great need for improvement. And we can choose as leaders to keep everything status quo, or we could choose to be fearless in identifying those problems. So what are those problems? It means getting to the root of those problems. And how do we do it? It takes real courage and tenacity. It also takes a leader who's really relentless and unwilling to accept it. I often think of a quote from Brene Brown, and she's one of my favorites. When I'm apprehensive about taking on something that seems like I might be playing with a hornet's nest when it comes to education. Brene says, daring greatly means the courage to be vulnerable. It means to show up and be seen, to ask for what you need, to talk about how you're feeling, to have the hard conversations. I'd encourage each of us as leaders to lean in with courage by not being afraid to acknowledge we don't know something. We need to really get out of our comfort zones and be willing to be vulnerable to admitting there's a problem. I'll use an example of what we say all the time in education. We use the word best practices. If you could kindly show me by giving a thumbs up, you can use um, the toolbar if you'd like. Give me a thumbs up or type into the chat best practices if you've said that within the last month or two months within your school system. I'll admit I definitely used it in large faculty meetings as a leader. I also used it in board and community presentations, and I later learned that what I referred to as best practices were not best at all, as they weren't research-based. Leaning in with courage and tenacity requires a relentless ability for us to each self-reflect and challenge our own entrenched beliefs and ways of doing things. If there's one takeaway from today's session that I'll ask of you, I'd ask you to remember about the use of best practices. And anytime you're ready to say that to your faculty, to your staff, to other colleagues, go back and fact check. Is there research to support what you think is best practices? So who's ready to be courageous with me? Please, this is a no judgment zone, so feel, feel free to take risks. You're in a very safe place as a learner with me who's willing to lean in and grow with you. So let's look at this writing sample. Would your teachers be able to identify the type of error the student made based upon this writing sample? And I'll make it a little bit easier for each of us because some of us may not be that adept in literacy. Let's look at that first line. I'll even give you a couple choices. Do you think that first line, when we look at it and we look at the word favorite, do you think it's a phonological error? 
an orthographic error, a morphological error, or a syntactic error? Please type it into the chat if you feel courageous and you're willing to share. Again, no judgment zone. I see Karen. Karen shared orthographic. Anyone else want to share orthographic? Orth oh, this is a, a highly adept group. Okay, so definitely the error is orthographic, but it's just one error and, it's, and it demonstrates one thing when we think about literacy. It demonstrates a really complex skill and the ability to be able to not only assess our students, but to have deep instructional knowledge in the science of reading and writing to be able to be prescriptive. So not only do we have to be diagnostic in recognizing that this is an orthographic error, but then we have to dig a little bit deeper and be able to really know what to do to help the student correct that error and to change that. And I'll point out as a leader, I didn't have this knowledge early in my career, nor did I possess it to lead my staff. And I'm not afraid to admit that I failed as a leader or a teacher. I didn't get it as an undergrad this training. I didn't receive it as a graduate student. And as a leader, I did a disservice to thousands of students and educators. For me, discovering the science of reading really ignited that passion and helped other, and I hope to help other educators, leaders, and parents advance this important work. So I have a question in the chat regarding how do I get this really cool chart? And I'm so glad you asked. This chart is actually available on our landing page that we created for you. So it's a freebie that we'd like to share with each of you to help you guide your staff so that they can better support their students in their learning. So some of us, I'm guessing, since many of you answered orthographic, you're very familiar with Dr. Hollis Scarborough's reading rope. But let's ask each other and maybe ask our educators that we work with, how many of our teachers are really equipped to understand every strand of this rope? But more importantly, can they recognize in looking at a student's writing, for example, which strands are the weakest? are the ones that have become unraveled. So if we're really preparing teachers to teach reading and the complexity of how to teach and provide the interventions for reading, they're able to intervene with all levels of students. And I love what Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen said at Ames, AIM Institute's research symposium just a little over two weeks ago. She said it has to be up here. So if teachers are really able to be diagnostic and prescriptive, they know how to teach based upon their skill sets and their knowledge. They're not looking in books. And our jobs as leaders is to really make sure that they have those skills. So that prescriptive instruction, it really starts with shared learning, right? It shares with our ability as leaders to say that I have to focus on asking the right questions and not focus on being the smartest person in the room. I have to learn to be a great learner and listener. And I know from my experience, I'm not always the best at sometimes listening, but what I've observed in some of the remarkable leaders that I'm fortunate to work with is that they leverage the strengths of their staff and they hire people who possess stronger knowledge and stronger skill sets than themselves. And that's where the difference comes in because we surround ourselves with people that grow us and we embrace shared learning together. So when you invest in that, your own professional growth, as well as your educators, this is where our real return on investment comes in. The greatest resource you have in each of your buildings in every district is your human capital, your staff. Let's think back to the reading rope. Have you invested in your teacher's professional growth by equipping them with the knowledge and skill set to not only unravel each strand of that reading rope for every child, 
but to also be able to remediate every skill deficiency through prescriptive instruction? Or are they still caught up in buy me a book, buy me a program, and then they expect to teach or remediate from that program to make difference the difference for their students? And remember, programs don't teach, teachers do. do. So let's like stop the initiative overload and stop the overloading of programs on our teachers by the, I would I say the spray and pray method where we spray all this stuff out there and we pray it works. Well, the programs aren't going to work unless our teachers are highly skilled to teach. And the next step is even harder for us, right? The next step is about shared leadership. Because as leaders, we tend to like control and we have to learn to how to create a system where we lead by example through mentorship of our own team. So how do we create this leadership system? Well, it means as administrators, we have to not only engage in learning with our teams, but we have to be able to walk the walk through our own examples. So as a building principal, I'd ask, do you model what high quality evidence-based practice looks like during professional development? Or do you turn it over to someone else? As a curriculum director, or let's say an assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, do you write curriculum alongside your staff? And as administrators, do you pay attention to what really matters? Teachers respect what administrators inspect. And I don't mean that from a gotcha standpoint. I mean that, that they pay attention to what matters to us. So when we prioritize our time as administrators, do we spend time in the classrooms each and every day? Do we block our schedules? Do we block a period or two a day where we're in classrooms with our staff, with our students? Because we all know what happens in a school. It's like mayhem every day. And if we don't prioritize learning, what happens is the problems of the day consume us and we never get to the important things, which is teaching and learning. And part four, I think, is the fun part because this is when the shared learning and leadership leads to us being able to implement a systems-based approach with a healthy accountability system. Leaders have to set up the systems that enable their schools to effectively advance evidence-based practice that support all students. Our ability to set high expectations for all staff members and hold people accountable for those expectations would support it. professional growth ensures a systems-based approach. And nothing breeds more success than celebrating the small and big wins that we have every day in our schools. And sometimes as leaders, we don't always find the time to do that. So when I walk in a building, what I like to look for, what do the bulletin boards tell me? Do I see examples of student work? Do I see examples of us celebrating the success we have with students? And do I see examples of us celebrating and learning as learners together as adults. So let's look more carefully when I mention systems. I want to hit on a few of these points because they're really critical in terms of breaking that teach to the middle philosophy. So one of the first things we have to have in place as leaders, and it's easier said than done, is a high quality curriculum that aligns to the standards. The standards really need to be the floor of our learning and the floor in the sense of it's the minimum. Let me say that again. It's the minimum of what students should know at that grade level. We need to provide extensive opportunities for growth such as STEAM and career technical education for all of our students. And let's think about even that curriculum. Do you know as a leader how to evaluate your current curriculum to look for skill gaps? I'm not aware in the work I do, and I'm fortunate to work with a team that works nationally across the country, but I have yet to find one off-the-shelf literacy curriculum or program that addresses all skill areas that need to be taught. So that being said, we really have to think about 
what are the things we need to do to put into place an effective structured literacy curriculum. And I'd like to quote Kareem Weaver because he shared this um, at our literacy symposium just two weeks ago. One of his favorite quotes, if your literacy program is not structured to get the most number of kids to the top or to that level of society or to proficiency, there is no equity. There can be no equity, no social justice without literacy. So the next point, maximizing instructional time. We as leaders have incredible autonomy when it comes to designing a schedule. But all too often, it becomes something that is just a mundane task that we don't spend a lot of time or attention with or look at the research to support. So are you maximizing instructional time, especially in the areas of literacy and math? When it comes to literacy, research shows that only 10% of instructional time is used for writing. Did you know that writing is an integral process in learning how to read? So why is it that we as leaders still are creating separate writing blocks and only allocating a very small percentage of instructional time to teach writing. Do we have all time, time built into the schedule for all learners to effectively master the skill levels? Now let's think about this. Not all students master skill levels at the same rate. So how do we expect learners to make a year's worth of growth if we keep giving everyone the same block of time to learn it. And let's talk about effective MTSS and RTI systems. Do you have a wait to fail model? If you're not sure, reflect on when you typically identify students. Remember the statistics that I shared at the beginning of the presentation? 70% of below average readers in first grade remain below average in eighth grade. So why? Why would we wait even till first grade to start screening students and start remediating those skill gaps? And then let's think about third graders with reading difficulties. They are likely to struggle throughout their entire educational careers. I saw that with my own daughter in fourth grade. She still struggles with reading. It's never a joy for her to be able to approach reading or writing, but fortunately she's had a lot of help through the years to help her learn strategies so she can be effective and can access a college education. What about our data systems? Do you have a comprehensive data collection system? Because we know with us in schools, we test and test and test, and a lot of times we don't even look at the data. Are we analyzing it? And are we leveraging the data to drive instruction, remediate and monitor student progress? So when I even say about improving curriculum, did you know that you can actually use your standardized data to look for gaps in your curriculum? So we do lots of standardized testing and it certainly allows us to assess where they are. Did they meet the floor of the learning with the standards? But do we also use it when we reflect on our curriculum? And then what about substantial investment in professional development? Remember the slide, return on investment? If we really need to, if we want to empower educators with the necessary knowledge, we have to invest in them. Today, we possess the ability to know how to teach students that actually gets them and, and, and forces them and, and it takes within their neurological system, we can rewire the brain. What, don't all our students deserve to have teachers like that in every single classroom? Or is it like a lottery? Depending on which teacher you get, good luck as a parent because we're not sure all of our teachers are equipped with those skills. And then also, we often forget about parent and community engagement to support student learning and growth. Typically, as parents, 
were often only invited in for parent and teacher conferences. Now at the elementary level, it's a little different. We have a lot more activities, but look what happens in middle school and high school. Parent-teacher conferences are the only time we're invited into the school. And how are you leveraging businesses in your community? Do you leverage them for real-world opportunities, career readiness? And we often say we're limited in resources. Do we reach out to the businesses to help them leverage some of the resources we need, let's say for STEM and career readiness? Do you see the pattern here with all the systems? Having Having effective systems, not teaching to the middle, requires that we eliminate this one-size-fits-all approach in education. All of our stakeholders, including our students, staff, community members, and parents, play a critical role in each in the education of each and every one of our students. So how can we expect to meet the needs of all learners if we design a system that doesn't have these pieces in place. And by the way, these bullet points, they are not new. They're old. Now I modified them a bit, but if you do research on the characteristics of high achieving schools, you will see all of these points included. For me, the real testament for all of the work really came down to a team approach. And I want to credit the team that I worked with. We had a national blue ribbon at the high school level for closing the achievement gaps for all subgroups. This is one of my proudest moments in education because it meant we removed the labels and we provided the supports regardless. And we also were very fortunate to create a comprehensive structured literacy curriculum based on the Orton Gillingham approach. And not only did we create a comprehensive system and curriculum in pre-K through four, but we are also able to create a dyslexia academy that really taught other teachers in the state to help meet the needs of their students. And lastly, here's a real testament to building a village that disrupts the one size fits all approach. It's just one of the numerous letters I received over the years from students. This middle school student struggled with dyslexia. He wrote this letter the first year he started to receive intervention using the Orton Gillingham approach. Dear Mrs. Brookhart, you invest a lot of money into this. Well, the school district did. Training teachers in OG, he was referring to. You have helped a lot of people like me. I started OG this year, sixth grade. I did not know how to spell very good. Until I started this now, I know how to write right. I know a lot of words that I didn't know before. I can spell very good now when I look at a passage and know what to do in all the words. Now, when my mom will tell me to read a sign, I can. I'm going to pause there. His mom was asking him to help her read the signs. Plus, your OG teachers are really good at their job, no doubt. Mrs. Clayberger is my teacher. Yes, Mrs. Clayberger, Joyce Clayberger was a phenomenal teacher. She was one of the first three teachers that was trained in my prior district in Orton Gillingham. She and her colleagues were true pioneers that really supported and led a seismic shift from balanced literacy to structured literacy. I shared this letter for two reasons. The first is to recognize some of the extraordinary people who are and still were, were and still are major disruptors and fearless educators in changing a system that was once designed to teach to the middle, and secondly, to demonstrate how each of us can impact student outcomes as a leader. We all have students like this one in our schools. How many of your students are unable to read a sign? I hope the student and your own students inspire you to recognize the urgency for change in our systems. So I'd ask you, be that disruptor, and ending these antiquated systems of mediocrity and be that agent of change for advancing equity and education through the science of reading for all learners. So let's lean in, love to open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, Dawn. I am feeling so inspired already. Um, 
I do want to just thank our live attend or viewers. I know some of you do need to uh, exit out because it's the end of your lunch period. But I just want to remind you that the video will be on our um, website on the science of reading what I wish I would have learned in college YouTube channel. We'll also post it on Facebook, LinkedIn, and on our website, wisconsinreads.org. Um, before anyone else has to step out too, I just want to remind you to mark your calendar um, for our next lunch and lead on April 22nd. Uh, at one o'clock central time where we're going to be featuring Brenda Warren, a former school board president of the Green Bay schools. Um, and now what a wonderful opportunity to ask Don any questions you have. Uh, please feel free to unmute if you prefer, or you can put things in the chat. I do see someone asking about um, a copy of the slides, if that's possible. Yes, I'd be happy to share with you, Nancy. We can actually, we created the landing page, so we can add them there as well, and we'll put the recording if that's okay with you. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll uh, make sure to have both the video and the landing page on our website as well, so people will have multiple ways to access it.